Okay, we have another one we want to uh, verify. We have an F and we have an inverse. This notation here means inverse. You have F to a little negative one. It doesn't mean F to negative one power. It doesn't mean one over F of X. That's just the notation that we use to indicate that the inverse uh, has been found. However, we just want to check to make sure that this really is the correct inverse. So we have our test right here. It's exactly the same as f of g and g of f, except now we just have some different notation. Now we, instead of the g, we've got the inverse in there. So we have the inverse inside and we have the inverse outside. So now we're going to go through both sides and when we go through this, so we get x for both sides, we verify that these are in fact, this is the correct inverse that we have. So for this one, you start by putting in the inverse inside the parentheses. The inverse here is x squared plus 3. We need to put this inside this one. So we'll first start by doing the template. Now the template says that we have something and then minus 3. So I've removed the x from here. I'm going to replace it with what I have inside the parentheses. That's going to be x squared plus 3. Okay, so x squared plus 3 minus 3, the two 3's, those are going to cancel and you're left with the square root of x squared and that equals x. A lot of times the question that's usually asked is, well, won't that be plus or minus x? The answer is no because the square root that's given here in this problem, they're just giving you the positive square root only. You're not going to have plus or minus unless you're actually taking the square root of both sides of an equation. Then you get plus or minus. But this they're automatically giving you the positive square root version there. So because you get the positive one, that means then uh, this is not going to have plus or minus on it. And so in the end, we're just going to get regular positive x, not plus or minus. Okay, now this one, we're going to put f of x inside the inverse here. So I have the inverse, and I'm going to put in f of x inside. So f of x is x square root of x minus 3. I'm going to put this into my inverse. So the template is I have something squared and I have plus 3. The space inside here, instead of x, I'm going to put in the square root of x minus 3. The square and the square root are going to cancel and you get x minus 3 plus 3. Once again, that does simplify the x. We've done both sides. We've verified that both of these are going to be, in fact, x. Okay, the rest of this question, it says state the domain and range uh, for those and then also do the graph. So I'm going to kind of do these both together. One thing you want to notice about this kind of question is your the domain of the original one, that's got to be equal to the range of the inverse. Likewise, the range of the original one is equal to the domain of the inverse. So I'm going to first start by drawing, uh, graphing the square root of x minus 3. So this goes back to the section talked about earlier on transformations. Transformations uh, says that we start with our base graph normally would be at zero and the square root of x minus three means we're going to move that three places over this way to the right. So that's going to start right here. And if we remember what our key points are for that, we're going to go up one and one to the right. And then if you want to start from here, we're going to go over four up to. So again, if you want to review the notes for that, that reviews the key points for, for that one. So this right here, this is our f of x. Now, if I want to take a look at, at this, this I want to, if I want to indicate the, from this picture, indicate the domain and the range, here's what it would be. So again, the domain of f, okay, from the picture, that's talking about values starting from 3 going on down to infinity. So basically I have from this, if I do interval notation, 3 comma infinity would be my domain of f. Well then let's look at also the range of f. Okay, so range of f is talking about the y values that the graph is using. Now in this case, y values start at 0 and they're going to go up here forever. So the range of f is going to be from 0 to infinity. So now that I have domain and range of each of these, now that's going to tell me how I'm going to draw my inverse. Now the inverse, since it's x squared plus 3, normally this would look like that. That would be some kind of a parabola. And it would be shifted up 3 units. And so it would, be, it would go through here. 
and it would look something like that. However, I have to be careful with this one because of this rule right here. It says that the for this one, for instance, going all the way across, that's using up all the x values. However, it says right here that my range of f is equal to the domain of f. My range of f is 0 to infinity. So that's telling me that, that my, the domain or the x values that can be used for this one have to also be the same from 0 to infinity. So right here, I'm actually only going to have this section of the graph appearing. I'm not going to have anything appearing here. So in other words, when I do this one, I would go from the starting point, I'd go over 1, up 1. That would be a dot right there. Or I can go over 2 and up 4. So if I do that, over 2 and up 4 would be here, which means that this would be my inverse. So again, what, what I'm looking at there is, the reason why I did that is because my, the range of f is equal to the domain of f. That means that the range of f is equal to the domain, this is the domain for my inverse. My domain can only go from 0 to infinity. So that's why I'm only showing this part of that one. So if you notice, again, if I were to draw a line right through here, earlier in the notes I talk about when you graph something, all the, whenever you do two inverses, they always have to be symmetric about the line y equal x. So if I take this graph and I fold it over on top of the other one, that means that one part of the graph can lay on top of the other one. What I also notice about this too is if I look at, let's uh, look at this point as an example. This point right here would be 4 comma 1. This point would be 1 comma 4. So if you notice, I actually have the opposite coordinates on each of those. The x and the y coordinates are switched. So because they are switched, that's why domain and range are switched on these as well. And when you, we get to the point where we're trying to find the inverse algebraically, one of the rules we do with that is you're switching your x and y. That's because we see this happening. You see 1, 4, and 4, 1. So that's how it all ties in together.